Lecture is entitled Ad Dajjal, the, and it's uh, the signs of the one of the signs of the last hour. And we would like to invite Sheikh Abu Amina Bilal Phillips to the stage to conduct the last lecture of the evening before we round off this peace conference in Oslo, Norway. Sheikh Abu Amina Bilal Phillips, please come now. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحابه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين. All praises due to Allah and may Allah's peace and blessings be on the last Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and on all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. The topic, the Jal, is one which all of the prophets of Allah warned their people about. Prophet Muhammad had said, Allah most great and glorious never sent a prophet without warning their nation about the Jal. Furthermore, the Prophet had said there is no trial from the time of Adam's creation until the last hour greater than that of Dajjal. So first and foremost it means that knowledge about Dajjal is not unique to Islam and truly in the system of Christianity, there is a belief concerning Dajjal. Of course, in English, Dajjal is called the Antichrist, Masih al Dajjal. And we can find references in the Bible, Old Testament as well as New Testament, concerning. Dajjal or the Antichrist. However, the image or the reality of the Antichrist is clouded, garbled, unclear in the earlier scriptures or what remains of the earlier scriptures. Because of that, we find at various points in the history of Christianity where individuals were identified from the past as Dajjal. For example, in the 12th century, there was a figure, a religious figure, Joachim of Fior, who had predicted that the third age of the Holy Spirit would begin in 1260. And he and his followers identified the Christian Emperor Frederick II as the Antichrist. Others saw Popes Boniface VIII and John XXII as the Antichrist. Even Martin Luther, in the uh, breakaway from Catholicism, he identified the papacy as the Antichrist. Not an individual, but the papacy itself. What Christianity had become under the Catholics, that this itself had become the Antichrist. Later on, 
the Antichrist became, in some of the writings of the Catholic Church, it became Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He represented uh, the Antichrist. Really, anyone who opposed the idea of Jesus being God, he became, from that perspective, the Antichrist. However, when we look at the text from an Islamic perspective, the Islamic descriptions are quite precise. The individual is described in great detail. What the circumstances of his coming describe with all of the events that would take place. Even to the point of his rule, how his rule would be, and his demise, how he would eventually be defeated. All of those details are there. Why? Why? Because knowledge about him is critical. That's why all of the prophets, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, upon them, all spoke about a dead job. But like the rest of their messages, the messages became changed. They were corrupted, interpolations, changes occurred which left the messages unclear. Since Prophet Muhammad was to be the last of the prophets, the Quran, the final revelation was preserved like none of the earlier books were preserved. Furthermore, information about the Jal was also preserved. It was given in detail and preserved the way that none of the earlier prophets had their sayings, their hadiths, their uh, teachings and prophecies preserved. That's why we have the whole science of hadith there to preserve, to know what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. Such a science didn't develop in the earlier generations. So, it is not surprising to find great details there about Dajjal. And the only complete picture here in the teachings of Islam. The ramblings of Nostradamus, which uh, led people to make movies and include the concept of the Antichrist or other similar writings of Christian sources or Jewish sources cannot compare with the vivid details found in the Islamic teachings. As such, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu had warned us that the Dajjal would not appear among people until they forgot about him. Until the Imams would stop mentioning him on the pulpits, in the masjids. Meaning, if we stop and think, when was the last time the Imam in the Masjid in the Khutbah of Juma, for example, spoke about Dajjal? I think we'd be hard pressed to remember when that last time was. It means that's the indicator that the time is getting close. What is close? Allah knows best. How close? Allah knows best. But no doubt, as the Prophet Sallallahu had said, لا تقوم الساعة حتى يبعث دجالون كذابون قريب من ثلاثين كلهم يزعم أنه رسول الله. Before the final hour would come, we would have at least 30 Dajjals all appearing, claiming that each one was a messenger of Allah. And we know we have them, we can list them. 
we have Gulam, Mirza Gulam, right? From uh, Ahmed, right? From India, Pakistan, who created his own religion, claiming that he was a messenger of Allah. We have uh, Ali Shirazi in Iran, claiming he is a messenger of Allah. So we have the Baha'is. We had in America, not to be outdone, we had Elijah Muhammad, who claimed he was a messenger of Allah, died in 1975, only to find in 1989 an Egyptian American, Rashad Khalifa, claiming he was a messenger of Allah. So if we start to add up those that have been claiming, the number 30 is quite close. We had an individual, Mahmoud Taha, in the Sudan in the 80s. He also claimed he was a messenger of Allah. But when the government shifted over to Islamic government, they executed him. <laughs> and from the time of the Prophet, وسلم, we know after he died, then the uprising which took place in Arabia, we had a bunch of prophets there too. We had Musaylama in the north, northeast. We had Al-Aswad Al-Anasi in the south. And we even had a female, Sajjah. She claimed she was a prophet. You know? So the number 30, I'm sure we have reached that number or very close to it. Maybe it's only 29 or 28, something like this. We've had them. And the Prophet ﷺ had warned us, as we said, that when we no longer hear Dajjal spoken about on the members in the khutbah of Juma, know that the time is near. So, because of that, the Prophet ﷺ used to teach a particular dua at the end of Salah after we finish from a tashahud he used to teach this particular dua Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min adhabi jahannam wa min adhabi al-qabr wa min fitnati al-mahiyya wal mamat wa min sharri fitnati al-masih al-dajjal that is O oh Allah I seek refuge in you from the punishment of hell the torment of the grave trials of living and dying and from the evil trials of the Antichrist, Al-Masih Al-Dajjal. And according to the Sahaba who narrated this particular dua, they said that the Prophet ﷺ used to teach them this dua the way he used to teach a surah or a chapter from the Quran. Meaning that great stress was placed on it, so much so, that among the Sahabas, we had, uh, or the Tabi'een, students of the Sahaba, uh, Ta'us, who on one occasion had asked his son whether he had made this supplication at the end of the prayer. And when the son said he hadn't, he told his son to repeat the prayer. It was that important. A dua which I'm sure if I asked how many people in the room know it, and use it, we'll find the number very small. So we need at least to come out of this lecture knowing the need and the necessity of learning this dua, its meaning, and using it in our daily prayers. Anyway, the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned 30 Dajjalun. Antichrists. But actually, when he explained who they were, he said that they would all claim that they were messengers of Allah. Whereas, Masih al Dajjal, the true Antichrist, he will go a step beyond that, as we'll see in more detail he will actually claim that he is 
Allah. This is the big difference between himself and the others. He will claim that he is Allah. And the term Dajjal is taken from the Arabic Dajjala, which means to deceive. So there's the element of deception there. So he's called Masih al-Dajjal, meaning the Christ, Masih al-Dajjal, who deceives people as to who he really is. Now, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu described him in terms which leave no room for interpretation other than a human being with particular characteristics which Allah has given him and abilities. Because some people, when you read some of the writings, they say that uh, Masih al-Dajjal, actually he is the television. One eye, just looking at you. Or they say it's really Freemasonry. You know, the symbol of Freemasonry again is that eye, right? On the pyramid, like in the American dollar. And there are no, uh, no end of interpretations people have made concerning Masih al Dajjal. However, the Prophet ﷺ described him as being blind in the right eye. And that right eye will move around in the socket, like it's floating in the socket, like a grape. Not in a fixed position, moving around continually. And his left eye will also be defective, having a thick film, which would be like green glass. And that eye will also be, the left eye will be blood, uh, be, will be bulging out of the socket. But he will have a right eye and a left eye. So it's not the television. Okay. <laughs> Secondly, the Prophet ﷺ said his complexion would be ruddy white. Ruddy white meaning that he is very white with a tinge of redness in the whiteness of his color of his skin. They call it ruddy white. There's white without that redness. Well, the redness is there. This is uh, one of the descriptions. Again, how does the television become ruddy white? It doesn't work. Then he also described him as having a prominent forehead prominent forehead, a big forehead, and a wide neck, right? His neck would be wide. Something like, um, those muscle, you know, those guys who do all this muscle stuff and they flex themselves, the neck is like that wide, something looking like that, right? Anyway, he will also be short, stout individual with a powerful build whose back because of the build will be slightly hunched right and his feet will be set apart he walks you know like you see some of these guys walking like this <laughs> he will also have very curly hair you know but thick curls so much so that when you look at it at a, at a distance, it will appear like snakes curling one on top of the other. Again, we have a hard time getting a television to look like this. <laughs> Furthermore, the Prophet ﷺ said that he looked most like a particular individual named Abdul Uzza ibn Qatan, who was from the Mustalaq clan of the Khuza'a tribe, who had died in pre-Islamic times. So it looked like a particular individual. So just rule out all of those interpretations that are trying to make him a system or 
technology or these kinds of things. This is, we're talking about an actual individual. Now, those who say, no, it doesn't really mean that, they say, well, because the Prophet Sallallahu had said that disbelief, kufr, or kafir, will be written between his eyes on his forehead, right? Which will be recognized, recognizable by both the literate and illiterate believers. That's it. Okay. How is that? Believers will be able to spot it and read it, understand it, know this is him. But the disbelievers won't be able to. So this is sounding like something symbolic. However, if the Prophet ﷺ informed it that way, and everything else that he's describing has a reality to it, then we just have to say, we don't know exactly how that's going to be. But, as the Prophet ﷺ said it, the believers will be able to see it. And they will be able to know it. And it's real. Now, the trial of Masih al-Dajjal is particularly severe. As we said, the Prophet ﷺ had said that there would not be from the time of the creation of Adam, a greater trial than the time of Masih al-Dajjal. We could say, well, okay, we all know anybody who claims to be God. We know he's not real. He's not true. So how could that be a trial for people at that time, especially for Muslims? Well, the reality is that Masih al-Dajjal is not going to just appear when everything is okay, life is moving along, not bad. You know, you have some hot spots, problems here and there, but life is generally okay. No, he will be coming at a time of trial. Prophet ﷺ had said that he wouldn't appear until after three years in which, in the first year of those three years, Allah would hold back one-third of the rain and one-third of the crops. The beginning of starvation and famine. In the second year, it will be two-thirds. Two-thirds of the rain will be held back, will not come down. Two-thirds of what was normally coming down on the earth will stop. And similarly, what is growing up from the earth. And in the third year, it stops completely. No rain. Nothing growing. And this is the time when Masih al-Dajjal will appear. And this is what makes the trial so great. Because when he comes, he will have with him a mountain of bread and meat. He will have with him a mountain of bread and meat. Now, when you're in a state of starvation, then this is something that's going to put you to the biggest test that you've ever faced. You want to eat of that mountain? Then you must believe in him. How? Believe that he is Allah. So, we're not talking about an easy test here. We're talking about something extremely severe. Because he will call people, as he moves about the earth, he will call people to accept himself as God. Those who do so, he will command the skies to rain in their area, and the rain will fall. And the land will grow. Trees, fruit trees, fully in bloom. I mean, when we think about faith right now, we know who God is and everything else, but when that circumstance arises, where somebody calls to the sky to rain, and you see this, this is beyond David Copperfield, right? He calls the sky to rain and it rains before your very eyes. And the land which was barren, the trees grow up and there is fruit on those trees. 
Who can hold themselves back at that point? Furthermore, those people who refuse to believe in him, they will find all of their properties lost. All the wealth that they had stored up, gone. And he will have with him two rivers. One, like liquid fire or lava. And the other one, white cool waters. One, which represents his paradise. And the other one representing his hell. The treasures of the earth as he moves about the earth will come out at his command and follow him like a swarm of bees. When people are seeing this with their eyes, their own eyes, a man walks and he commands the treasures of the earth, the earth to open up and its treasures come out and start following him. Where will we be? What will be the status of our faith at that point? And he will enter all of the cities of the earth with the exception of two cities, Mecca and al Medina. But what will happen is that he will go to the outskirts of al Medina, and he will stop there. And then, Three earthquakes will hit the city, shaking it. And following that, the disbelievers and the hypocrites will leave Medina and join him. Disbelievers and hypocrites. We all know that the people of Medina are all supposed to be Muslims. So where are the disbelievers coming from? Obviously, there are people who are Muslims in name. They will come out. Those who are pretending to be Muslims, the hypocrites, they will come out. So this is a trial which we can hardly imagine. Furthermore, just to notch things up, to the highest point you can imagine he will approach certain people among them Bedouins and he will ask them if I were to resurrect your parents would you testify that I am your Lord if this man comes to you your parents are dead and he says, if I were to bring to life your parents and you could see them with your own eyes, would you believe that he is your Lord? Who could hold back at that point? And when the individuals say yes, because hey, only God can resurrect. Two devils from the jinn will appear before them one looking like the man's father and the other one looking like the man's mother saying to him follow that man our little son follow him because he is your Lord this is not a joke this is a very very serious trial and he will bring people back to life Cut people in half, walk between the halves, and command the body parts to come back together and they'll come back alive, smiling. He will appear from the east. Prophet had said that Jah will appear from a land in the east called Khurasan and will be accompanied by people whose faces look like flat beaten iron. <laughs> flat beaten iron meaning flat faced 
This is usually associated with people from China. <laughs> Their faces tend to be flatter, wide and flat. And this is why earlier scholars thought that these people were in fact the Mongols. That maybe Genghis Khan, he was the Jal at one point. But this is not the case. The Jal has not come as yet. And he will come in conflict with Muslims, Muslim forces, between Syria and Iraq. And there will be among his followers a large number of Jews. Jews who are still waiting for the Christ to come. Who rejected Prophet Jesus salam, when he came. They were already waiting for a Christ to come. A Messiah. Messiah. They were waiting for him. When he came, they rejected him. So they continued to believe that he is to come. There was one individual uh, at the turn of the century in Turkey who claimed that he was from among the Jewish community, that he was the uh, Messiah. And a lot of people believed in him when the uh, Turkish Sultan had him arrested and brought to him and Islam was explained to him, he accepted Islam. So he wasn't the one. Anyway, the point is that they continue to wait. So when Al-Masih, Al-Dajjal appears, it's not surprising that many will flock behind him from amongst them because they were waiting for this Christ to come. And the Prophet Sallallahu described them as such. Now, he will rule the world basically for 40 days. The first of those days will be as long as a year. 365 days. That will be the first day of his rule. When the Prophet ﷺ said that to the companions, the first question that they asked him was, how will we pray on those days? A day like that, which lasts for a year, how do we pray? That was their concern. See how important Salah was to them? That's the first question they asked. How will we pray at that time? And the Prophet Sallallahu said, you estimate it. You estimate it. Of course, for people in the desert, where they didn't have any clocks. Time is judged by a stick in the sand and the shadow as it moves. How in the world are you going to estimate when there is no shadow moving? If you stop to think about it. The Prophet ﷺ was obviously talking about a time to come when time could actually accurately be estimated. This is our time. These are these times. And this is part of the evidence of the prophethood. The Prophet Muhammad predicted a time would come when time could be estimated in this way. You could estimate what is the time for Fajr, Dhuhr, Asr, Maghrib, and Isha. The second day would be as long as a month. The third day as long as a week, and then the remaining days would be like normal days. So he will rule the world, creating this fitna, where people are called to believe in him as God, called to worship him. And many on the earth will submit. However, Allah will send from amongst the Muslims in those days towards the end of the rule of Dajjal the Mahdi. The Mahdi will arise amongst Muslims and start the struggle against the forces of Ad-Dajjal. 
But those forces will become besieged in Jerusalem. And when a Dajjal with his forces now are ready to wipe them out, finish them off, then Allah will send Prophet Isa alayhi salam. Jesus will return in his second coming. And he will come in the region of Damascus and from there he will go to Jerusalem. And this is when he comes at Fajr to the masjid there, identified as Masjid al-Aqsa. And the Mahdi will be stepping forward to lead the prayer. When he realizes that Prophet Isa is there, he steps back to let Prophet Isa lead. And Prophet Isa will stop him and tell him to lead. Confirming that is not a new revelation being brought. It's the same revelation. And the uh, religion is the religion of Islam. Then the uh, gates of Jerusalem will be thrown open. And when a Dajjal spots Jesus coming out with his forces, he begins, as the Prophet ﷺ described, he begins to melt. And he tries to run. Prophet Jesus will chase him, go after him, and kill him with a spear, then lift up the spear to show the people the blood on the spear, confirming that a Dajjal is killed. And that will be the end of the trial of a Dajjal. The Prophet ﷺ had given us general guidelines as to how we prepare ourselves for that time. Of course, the first guideline is that one must be a firm believer in Islam. The example which he gave was that among the people who will be cut in half and rejoin will be a young man who, after he has been cut in half and rejoined, and the Jal calls him to believe and to worship him, that young man will say, I know that you are the false Christ. Your cutting me in half confirms that you are, in fact, the false Christ. And the Jal will grab him by his neck, try to cut his head off. He will be unable to do so. So he grabs him by the feet and the neck and throws him into that river of fire, molten lava. And people will see him fall in and be burnt up, dissolve. And it will appear that the Jal has won, defeated him. But the Prophet ﷺ clarified that what he went into was the path to paradise. He went on into paradise. And he called him the greatest mar martyr in the sight of the Lord of all the worlds. That individual will be firm on his faith. So what's going to hold him is knowing Islam, practicing Islam seriously, to be seriously committed to Islam. Because that's what's going to save us from the situation like what happens to those people in Medina. And why it is that they would come out when the earthquake hits the, the, the city. Because their faith was f fake or, re or, or weak, so weak that it just dissolved when a major trial hit them. So our defense against that is to be serious Muslims. And not serious Muslims when we hear the Jal is here. You know, that's not the time. They'll say, okay, I'll wait. Okay, as soon as I hear he's going to be here, then I'll get down and be a real serious Muslim. It doesn't work like that. This is something that we have to decide to be now. We have to be real Muslims now. Most of us have been living the lives of what we would call counterfeit Muslims. Some people are called Friday Muslims, meaning they only come to the masjid on Friday. 
They never pray in the other the days of the week. Or they're called Ramadan Muslims. We only see them in Ramadan. They come on out in Ramadan, they're praying taraweeh, everything. Reading Quran. But as soon as Eid comes, everything is packed and put away. They enjoy Eid, and then we don't see them again till next Ramadan. We call them Ramadan Muslims. So we have another kind of Muslim which never existed in the earlier times. Friday Muslims, Ramadan Muslims. These are fake Muslims. There's no such Muslim. Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Ahd al-Ladhi baynana wa baynahu salat. Wa man tarakahu faqad kafar. The distinctions between us and the disbelievers is salah. Whoever abandons the prayer, salah, has become a disbeliever. That is a clear statement. Some people philosophize, does he mean a real disbeliever or, you know? Hey, the Prophet ﷺ said, he abandons the prayer, he's become a disbeliever. End of story. There's no room to interpret and justify. No, no, that's it. And it's real, it's real. I mean, because Islam is not just saying that one is a Muslim. It's on the birth certificate, religion, Islam. This is not what makes a Muslim. My parents were Muslims. They were good Muslims, in fact. I'm Ahmed, or I'm Fatima. I'm a Muslim too. But I drink alcohol and I eat pork and, you know, party. This, this, this is not Islam. This is not real Islam. This is fake. This is false. It's not acceptable to Allah. Then somebody says, well, you know, Prophet Muhammad said, Kullu ummati yadkhuluna jannah. All of my nation will enter paradise. Yes, Prophet ﷺ did say that. But he didn't stop there. He said, Illa man aba, except for the one who refuses. So the companions asked, Who would refuse, O Messenger of Allah? He said, Man ata'ani dakhal al jannah. Wa man asani faqad aba. Whoever obeys me will enter paradise, and whoever disobeys me has refused. Whoever disobeys me has refused. So our disobedience to the Prophet ﷺ, which can begin with very small things, like for example, sisters like to pluck their eyebrows. It's a small thing. But the Prophet ﷺ cursed it. He said Allah's curse is on the woman who plucks her eyebrows and the woman who has her eyebrows plucked. So when we go and pluck our eyebrows, we are disobeying the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu It is an active act of disobedience. And that, people say, well, you mean to say I'm going to go to hell just because I pluck my eyebrows? It is a sign. It is a sign. Because when we make sins, which the Prophet has clearly defined for us as sins, when we make them minor, we say they're little sins. No, we shouldn't have to go to hell for that. Prophet said, Iyakum wa muhakkarat al dhunub. Beware of the scorned sins, these little ones. Because he said they're like sticks in a valley. A people settle in that valley and they go out to look for sticks to make fire to cook their bread. So when they gather up all the little sticks, they make a huge bonfire. So that's what happens with these scorn sins. It's only a small one. But those small ones add up. It's a mentality. When we have that mentality of the small sins, not a big deal, then 
It's easy to do more and more and more until we find ourselves in major sins. Disobeying the Prophet ﷺ, refusing paradise. So that is our strongest line of defense. That is to cling firmly to Islam. The second is that the Prophet ﷺ had recommended that we memorize the first 10 or the last 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf. This is the Surah which we are encouraged to recite every Friday. And this Surah talks about the signs of Allah in the various stories of it. So we should be in the habit of reading it and we should memorize the first and the last or the last 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf. Thirdly, we should seek refuge in Allah with that dua which I mentioned in the very beginning at the end of every salah as the Prophet ﷺ taught and as the companions did. Learning it like the way they learned a chapter from the Quran. Furthermore, we should remember Allah frequently. We should be in constant remembrance of Allah. Being conscious of Allah in whatever we're doing. Not remembrance of Allah meaning that we're just saying SubhanAllah, 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 SubhanAllah. Because, you know, that's easy. It's so easy that we say it and don't even know what we're saying. So SubhanAllah becomes SpanLah. Right? SubhanAllah becomes SpanLah. Alhamdulillah becomes Hamdlah. Allah Akbar becomes Lakbar. So we have to say 33 times after every prayer SubhanAllah, Walhamdulillah, Allah Akbar. And that which should take some time, giving us time for reflection. SubhanAllah. Alhamdulillah, Wallahu Akbar, become Spanda Alhamdulillah, Spanda Alhamdulillah, Spanda Alhamdulillah, Spanda Alhamdulillah. We're able to finish it off in no time. So much so that I remember some people accepting Islam coming with me to the masjid, you know, this was in Dubai, and um, I showed them the basic prayer, and after the prayer, they were looking around and watching the people there. And then they asked me afterwards, you know, I said, after the prayer, all the people, their hands start to shake. <laughs> what is this thing, you know? Of course, what's happening, right, is people counting at the speed of light, right? <laughs> so I had to explain to them that really, you know, the intention was supposed to be, subhanAllah, reflecting on the glory of Allah, alhamdulillah, being grateful for what Allah has given us, Allah Akbar, recognizing Allah's greatness in everything in our lives. That this is what was supposed to be said and reflected upon. But unfortunately, it became a blind ritual. So know that this is of no use. Stop it. Actually, it is a disservice to ourselves. Because when we say Spanlah, instead of Subhanallah, what have we done to Allah's name? Lakbar. What have we done to Allah's name? Allahu Akbar becomes Lakbar. Lak. We have distorted Allah's name to the point that you think this is pleasing to Allah? Your name is Muhammad, somebody calls you Muhammad. Are you going to accept that? He calls you Muhammad. My name isn't Muhammad, it's Muhammad. Right? You don't like it, you're not going to appreciate it. So why are we going to do it to Allah? These are things that we need to stop for a minute and think about. Where we have turned the rituals of Islam, which are supposed to help us to get closer to Allah, we have turned them into blind rituals. So this is not remembrance of Allah. True remembrance of Allah means whether we're saying dhikr, subhanallah, we do it really remembering Allah. 
Not subhanallah, alhamdulillah, blah, blah, blah. And our man, mind is somewhere else. We're still figuring, okay, okay, after the thing. It's subhanallah, subhanallah, subhanallah. The fingers are still going. You know, we're checking the time. Or, yes, got finished yet? Not, not quite. This is, this is not remembrance of Allah. I'm sure you would agree with me. But this can no way be considered remembrance of Allah. But this is what we're doing. This is what we've been doing. This is what our parents have been doing. So, it means that there is a need, a major need for change. If we are to be prepared in any way, shape or form for the coming of Dajjal, then we have to change our whole approach to the religion altogether. We have to get serious. And the other point that the Prophet ﷺ warned us about is to flee from Dajjal. If we hear that Dajjal is coming to Oslo, don't think I'm going to be that young guy who's going to be ready for Dajjal. No. Don't think that you're going to be up to it. Right? You hear he's coming, then you better, as they say, get out of Dodge as quickly as possible. This was the advice of the Prophet ﷺ. So, when we think about a Dajjal, a Dajjal being among the final major signs of the coming of the hour, we should also reflect on the statement of the Prophet ﷺ found in Sahih al-Bukhari when a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, Mata sa'a ya Rasulullah? When is the hour? When is it coming? And he said, Mada a'daddala? What have you prepared for it? That's the big one. The knowledge of the hour, it's known only to Allah. Every year you've got somebody getting, getting up and saying, it's coming 1210. Is it 1210? Or 2012, or some numbers like this. Yeah. People have been predicting the end of the world since I don't know how long. Nobody knows. Prophet Muhammad himself didn't know. Allah confirmed nobody knows except himself. So the issue is not about when. The issue is about, are we prepared? So as he told the man, what have you prepared for it? That's what we need to ask ourselves. We've heard about the job. We understand what his trial is going to be. And the real challenge is, how prepared are we ready to be? If we are prepared, we'll be able to handle. If we're not prepared, we'll not be able to handle it. That's as simple as that. It's not a complicated thing. Very simple. To be prepared, we talked about those things. It's about taking Islam seriously. Knowing that Islam, as we have all heard so many thousands of times, Islam means submission. It's Islam. Submission to the will of God. Submission to the will of Allah. This is something which you cannot inherit. Yes, you can inherit a name, a family title, etc. But can we inherit submission? No. It is not something you can inherit. Submission is something each and every one of us has to do for himself or for, for herself. It's an individual decision that each and every one of us has to make. And without making that decision to submit, then we remain Muslims with a big question mark. Because until that decision is made, then we haven't submitted. We're just carrying on. So we will be like those that the Prophet ﷺ described in Sahih Muslim who will do the deeds of the people of paradise. They will pray, they will fast, they will give zakah. But, he said, they will be from the people of hell. 
They will do the deeds of the people of paradise as it appears to people. People will see them praying, fasting, but they will be of the people of hell, meaning that those actions have no internal reality. So this is the challenge, to be true Muslims, real Muslims, not counterfeit Friday Muslims, Ramadan Muslims, etc., but real Muslims. So this requires each and every one of us to take on this issue of submission seriously. And the best way is to begin with the basics. Re-establish the basics. If we're not praying five times a day, then that's what we have to get back to. Establish those basics. Don't worry about the sunnahs. Just start with the basics. Establish those basics. And fasting Ramadan, establish it. If we're fasting Ramadan, then we try to extend that fast to two days every week, Mondays and Thursdays. Increase our ibadah. Zakah and Hajj, establish it. Put these acts back into our lives and put it in with a commitment from our hearts and not just a physical exercise that we go through, something we said we did, but the hearts weren't really there. Islam, real Islam, submission is Islam, is something which has to come from the heart. And that's why the Prophet had said, Inna fil jasadi mudra. There is in the body a clump of flesh. Ida saluhat, saluhan jasadu kullu. If it becomes good, then the whole body becomes good. All of the actions of the body become righteous actions. Ida fasadat. And if it goes bad, then all of the actions of the body becomes bad. Allah wa al qalb. It is none other than the heart. So this is what we have to start working on to become serious Muslims, to be able to meet the challenge of Dajjal when and if we meet it in this world. Barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Does anyone want to pose a few questions? I mean, that literally it's a few questions, really. A couple of choice questions, maybe. Let's say one from the brothers, one from the sisters. Yeah? It's just that we don't have much time. We've got to get out of the place. We've got to wrap up. We've got to, yeah? How are we going to decide? Hmm. Uh, sister over there. Okay. One sister. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Does the Illuminati and the Antichrist have any connection? Illuminati and the Antichrist. Freemason. The Illuminati, you know, part of the uh, hidden um, secret societies, we don't know their reality. There's no need to try to make connections. Al-Masih al-Dajjal, he's real. We have real information about him. Those that are involved in evil, in corruption, in worshipping other than Allah, calling people to worship other than Allah, they will become his followers. Whether they're from the Illuminati or any other you know, of these uh, so-called secret societies, Rosicutions or whatever, there are many of them out there. Uh, they will become the followers of a Dajjal, without a doubt. Zakhla uh, brother, over here. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Salatu wassalamu ala Rasulullah. Salamu alaykum. Salam. Just concerning reciting uh, the Surat al-Kahf on Friday, prayers on Friday, the days of the Friday. 
Because I, I've heard from one of the critics of Hadith, Sheikh Abu Ishaq, maybe you know him, Sheikh Abu Ishaq Hawaini. He, he commented about this Hadith and he said, you know, all the Hadith concerning, you know, reciting Surah Al-Kaf on Fridays is weak and there is no authentic Hadith. But it's rather, as you know, goes for the whole week, you can recite it and for the whole week. There is no specific narrations which specifies the uh, Friday. Allah mm -hmm. Well, uh, uh, regarding question, that, Sheikh, can you the, just say the question, question? Uh, as our brother has uh, narrated that he heard from one of the scholars, uh, Sheikh Ishaq al huwaini that uh, the hadith for uh, Friday reciting Su al Kahf on Friday, uh, the narrations were weak. Um, uh, as far as I know, that the narrations were authentic. So one would need to look as to on what basis that he said they're weak. Uh, one could say that maybe they're weak, but there may be four or five different narrations. So if there are more narrations, though one may say such and such a narration, all of these narrations are weak, <coughs> like the Salat al-Tasbih, for example, you know, where they said that all the narrations are weak, yet the Hadith in its uh, collection of narrations could be elevated to the level of Hassan Lighayrihi. Possibly. I'm just saying this as a possibility. But in any case, the bottom line is, if you have some research on it that you can gather and send to me, I would be happy to have a look at it. And I will pass on you know, what narrations I have which were authenticated. And then we can uh, see uh, to what degree the statement is accurate or not, inshallah. We've got another Biology. question from the sisters. You're being generous now. No? Yeah, yeah. It's unlike you sisters to be not to be ready. We do have questions. Okay. There are different stories about where the jail is. Some say he's under in the mountains and others say he's under the sea. So where is he? Okay, where is the Dajjal? Well we knew that. The Location of Dajjal at this point in time, we don't know. We just know that he will appear in or from the area of Khurasan. That's where he will appear when he actually engages, starts the process of actually engaging and rallying people around himself. We know that in the time of the Prophet, ﷺ, one of the companions, Tamim al Dari, you know, had mentioned uh, visiting an island. With uh, or being shipwrecked on an island with some other companions, and they had come across uh, a chained individual on the island, and the Prophet ﷺ had confirmed that this person claimed he was Dajjal, confirmed that he was in fact a Dajjal. So, um, where that island is, Allah knows best. Uh, there have been speculations ab about its location and um, how it is that he may have been alive from that time until the time that he appears freed from the chains or whatever. This is all knowledge known only to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It was not uh, informed uh, to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He didn't inform us about it. So we just have to take things you know, as the narrations come. There's no evidence for him being under think, the sea. No That's moment. nonsense. I don't know actually. Um, um, the, the people are queuing up here, yeah? Uh, no, excuse me, brother. I think the, sorry, um, pardon me. Pardon me, I think he was first. Yeah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh, my question is the following one. Uh, will uh, repentance or tawbah be accepted in the time of Dajjal? And the second one is, I heard from the, that the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he said, the Dajjal will be in the world for 40 days and he will go around all, all over the world. So my question is, will he meet all the people individual? No, me and he and he. Sorry. <laughs> well, okay. Can we get a summary of that one? Sorry, because we were getting like messages. Uh, the Dajjal, say it again. Okay. Uh, sorry, because my, <laughs> The first one is, uh, will the Dajjal repentance or Tawbah be accepted in the oh, time no. of the Jal. Yes. This is the first uh, repentance one. Repentance will be accepted in that time, as the Prophet Sallallahu had said, that repentance would continue to be accepted until the sun rises from the west.
What about uh, that the Prophet said that in that time, the one who didn't have Iman before, it, it won't help him? What do you say about that? Well, I don't know about that in reference to the time of Dajjal. No. I don't know about that narration in the time of Dajjal. Okay, the second one is that <coughs> the Prophet وسلم, said that the Dajjal will be in the world for 40 days, right? Yeah. And then he, he will go uh, all over the world village by village, town by town. And my question is, will the Dajjal meet every people uh, by individual, like me and he, and so like that? <laughs> Not me, I well, don't you see, again, I mean, you're seeking details which nobody can answer. We don't know. You know, the Prophet ﷺ said that he would uh, enter every town. Whether he meets every individual in the town or not, that's neither here nor there. What I want, uh, can somebody hide from him? From him? <laughs> no. As the Prophet Sallallahu had said, if you hear that he's coming, get out, flee. Allahu Akbar. That's enough. Okay, sisters, one more, a sister over here. Really, we're very short of time, so make it very quick. So we can get a few more questions in. Bismillah. You said that when you get thrown in the river of hell with the jail that, so the question is, does it hurt? <laughs> does it hurt? No pain, no gain. <laughs> Next question. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I'm salam. Um, oh, um, you said something about harassa. Um, is that area near Afghanistan? Whereabouts is it? Yes. Uh, is that it's the area. Is the whole of the Afghanistan? Or what? No, no, it is the, he said in the region of. How f wide that region is, Allah knows best. Will he appear from that area or will he be from there? He's appearing like from that area. He, he is coming that. to that area and he'll be announced at that area. That's when he will be known to people. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Let's have. Sheikh, I think one more sister, but you have to talk about the university. One more sister. What has Dajjal done to achieve the position? Sorry? What has he done to achieve that position? What is he going to achieve? What has he done to, po um, to po achieve that position? Dajjal. The position he would get when he came back. Can you understand? <laughs> They understand. I don't know what. <laughs> what has the child done to achieve the position that he oh, has? Okay. What's he done? What's he done? Why was he selected to be a Dajjal? Huh? Like that. Yeah. Sorry, I couldn't answer that one. I couldn't understand it to answer it. Okay, but brother, you're gonna I, I, if, try. If, so if somebody else can give a tafsir of what she was saying, we can... Tafsir. Allahu Akbar. No. What has he done to achieve his status? Yeah. Yeah, what has he done to achieve his status to be a Dajjal? Allah knows best. I mean, he, Allah has given him those powers we could say what have the jinn done to have the powers that they have you know what has an elephant done to be big and strong <laughs> yeah allah gave him that power you know this is we don't have to get into what they do to get it right yeah okay brother just one last question i'm yeah. sorry we've got to wrap up because we've got to wrap up the whole evening and award some things. Fadda. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Salam. Uh, Shaykh, I have a question regarding the uh, Khurasan. There, there is another hadith regarding when uh, the Mahdi alayhi salam will start against the Jal from Medina. So there will be another army from Khurasan who will also fight the Jal from there until they reach in, to Palestine. So, do you have any further more information or if you can confirm it? I don't have any further information on that. Okay. Zakhalakhe. Zakhalakhe. Very short. Just uh, what can we say to our friends who, 
who doesn't believe uh, there is no su such thing called the day of uh, judgment. They say, me, when I die, then I'm finished. You can burn me or can you throw me in the sea? <clears throat> what are you asking? He's saying, <laughs> we have some friends who doesn't believe that there is a thing called day of judgment. You mean non-Muslim, okay. oh, yet, yeah, yet to be Muslim. Yes. Yet to be Muslims so don't believe in the So you're asking what can you say to them? Yeah. Well, you know, the logic, you know, the logical arguments for the Day of Judgment involve accepting or accepting the idea that for this life to make sense, where people do good and seemingly have difficult lives, etc. Some people may do evil and have good lives. If, if that's all there is, there is nothing beyond this, no accounting, then why be good? Why not just go for it, kill whoever you can, steal, just, you mm. know? I mean, yeah. that way of thinking is the way of thinking of the animals. And that's what distinguishes us from the animals. The animals, you know, in the jungle, they just go for it. You're a lion, you're the biggest, the toughest, then you kill everybody else and enjoy, right? That's the life of the animals. So if that's how you see yourself, then, mashallah, you know, <laughs> you know? Zak Zak when you meet Allah, Allah then, you know, you'll yeah. know the reality then. But if, if you have any kind of reflection on, you know, uh, justice or uh, the concept of life having any meaning, then it doesn't make sense that there wouldn't be a judgment. It's logical and reasonable that there is one. Zakhrah khair, Sheikh Abu Amin Bala Phillips for the enlightening talk and the question and answer session. Mm -hmm.